Welcome to Premium Cashflow Real Estate Investing Podcast with Sakar Kali. During this program, you will hear guest experts sharing their experiences, best practices, and market insights. We discuss investing in multifamily apartment complexes and how a busy professional can passively invest hassle-free in various opportunities. Your host, Sakar Kali, owns millions of dollars of assets and has done thousands of value-add projects over 20 years now. So listen in for insights. Here's your host, Sakar Kali. Welcome to another edition of Premium Cashflow Podcast. Uh, today, I have the pleasure of speaking with uh, Christopher Calendra. Uh, he is with Elliott Wealth Management Services. Uh, he is a certified financial planner, CFP. Uh, with over 26 years of experience. And with Chris, the interesting thing is that he has ventured uh, and done a lot of real estate, uh, uh, you know, different uh, property flipping, construction, fire damage, and environmental hazard properties as well. So he brings in a very unique uh, sense of experience into how a global financial outlook for a person uh, can, uh, should be rather. And Chris works with a lot of entrepreneurs, retirees, and families, uh, uh, you know, helping them set up their uh, financial goals and objectives. He is dedicated to each client and gives individual attention uh, and has strategies tailored to achieve their goals. Uh, Chris is also a host of a podcast called Simply Financial Podcast and is also a co-host uh, of the Carnivore Radio Program, which can be heard in Hartford uh, County in Connecticut on 88.1 FM and online at wesufm.org. So it is exciting time, Chris. I appreciate your time. Thank you for joining today. Oh, yes. These are exciting times and I appreciate you having me on the show. I have been um, listening to your show and I've really enjoyed the episodes I've listened to. So this is... Uh... This is exciting. I'm glad we're doing this. I appreciate your time. So uh, for listeners who may not have heard uh, on some of the details of your background, uh, Chris, uh, g- take a few minutes and give us some background and we can, uh, you know, get rolling on the things that you want to talk about today. Yeah. So as you described, I'm a certified financial planner. So I work with individuals, families, and small business owners, helping them achieve their financial goals. And so we do financial and investment planning. Uh, You mentioned that um, in my experience over 26 years, a lot of people in my role, they shy away from real estate investing for a whole host of reasons. But it's something that I have embraced both personally and professionally. Most of the people that I've met and worked with over the course of my career have used real estate to at least a small extent, sometimes to a large extent, to help them build wealth and become affluent. Mm -hmm. So my own personal model is that I've invested in real estate uh, all along the way. My first property I bought at 22 years old, and it was a common story, right? Sakar, I got out of college. Uh, Instead of renting, I got it in my head that I'd be better off owning, and I bought a condo, bought a Mm two-bedroom condo, and I rented out the room to my buddy. Sure. Mm-hmm. So he paid me rent, supplemented the mortgage. We had a heck of a time. It's a <laughs> lot of fun. And then he moved out and uh, somebody else moved in. But I was always able to have a friend that supplemented the mortgage. And that was my first foray into real estate. So I am on the path to becoming increasingly wealthy. I've done very well for myself. I've been lucky, blessed, hardworking, all of that has been contributing factors in that success. But part of my plan to build wealth is to focus on stocks and bonds, investments, 401ks, IRAs, college funds, uh, but also to use real estate. So I have a small portfolio of real estate. It's a mix of commercial and residential. So as I meet with clients to help them achieve their financial goals, if they're interested in investing in real estate or they want to invest in real estate or maybe they already have some, it's not something that I want to push away or uh, discourage. I'll actually encourage it 
Mm -hmm. as you know, and we're going to talk a little bit about it. You have to be careful. It's not for everybody. It's not sure. easy, mm -hmm. but um, it is part of an overall good financial plan for people that want to invest in real estate, whether it's buy and hold, income producing, value add. Uh, so my experience in real estate helps me serve my clients. Sure. It is interesting, uh, Chris, you mentioned that how, uh, you know, accidentally uh, or, or perhaps by, by natural, by design, you became, uh, you know, sort of a, a landlord by, you know, we call the technical term of house hacking, wherein, you know, yeah. you have a house and either you have a roommate or you're intentionally renting out to a few folks and they are kind of supplementing your mortgage payments and things like that. Uh, and for a lot of folks that I know, that is a sort of a natural transition that uh, either they'll have their first house, they would have just kind of upgraded to a bigger, better home and they are renting it out, but they find out, hey, you know what, this is great. I want to do sure. more. And they kind of go down that path into real estate. Uh, so, uh, Chris, uh, one of the things that I definitely like about, uh, you know, I think what we're going to discuss as well is also that balance that you bring in in terms of not only you're bringing in your experience of helping so many clients, uh, but also that uh, balanced outlook of, you know, whether it's stocks, bonds, real estate, and things like that. Uh, maybe, you know, perhaps I, I am personally also interested into, you know, what is your outlook about, you know, doing some angel investings or perhaps, uh, you know, some of the alternative uh, uh, strategies like, you know, Bitcoin or blockchain uh, uh, coins and things like that. So, uh, I mean, there's a lot of buzz out there. Sure. Uh, we don't know what's right, what's wrong, you know, what's the sort of the most conservative way to invest and things like that. Uh, so, but obviously I'm, I'm looking forward to discussing all of that uh, with you. Uh, why don't you perhaps maybe uh, share with us what is sort of your overall arching plan as sure. to how you view this and how you kind of take new clients and uh, kind of walk us through that progression, mm -hmm. how you set that up. Beautiful. So we'll break it down to seven wealth building rules. And this certainly applies for real estate investors and I think would um, be good guidance for your listeners. Sure. Um, but number one is establish goals. You've probably <laughs> talked about this on your show before, but you want to have goals. You want to sure. write them down. All of the academic and psychological research shows that if you have goals, you're more likely to be successful. If you write them down, that increases the chances to be successful. Sure. Um, so I think that's first and foremost. Mm -hmm. And I will add that I'm a huge proponent in thinking short-term, mid-term, and long-term. So to give you an example, mm -hmm. sticking with the real estate theme, you might meet somebody that has never invested in real estate before, and mm -hmm. they might say, I want to own 50 properties. That's a pretty ambitious goal, right? right? And we would encourage someone to pursue that goal. It's a worthy goal. But if they only focus on that long-term goal, but don't think in terms of the mid and the short-term, I think they're reducing the chances that they successfully move towards that goal. Sure. So a short-term goal would be, let's get one property. Mm -hmm. You know, what do we need to do in the short term to acquire our first investment property? Mm -hmm. And then how many would we want to have, let's say in three or five years? So I'm a big believer in having goals, writing them down. That's pretty common. Mm -hmm. But I think uh, the personal twist on it is not just to have long-term goals, but to have short and midterm goals, which increases the chances you ultimately get to the long range destination. Sure. sure. And, and a related question that uh, Chris is like, for example, when we talk about goals, you know, uh, obviously, uh, you know, person can have your health goals, your relationship goals and financial uh, sort of metrics in terms of what they want to achieve. Right. So here I assume we are definitely talking about the financial goals. Right. So when you are saying, Chris, that uh, have a goal, are you proposing that maybe have some type of a cash flow number per month or perhaps like a, um, you know, maybe have some net worth or equity number? Uh, can you clarify yes. what exactly you mean by uh, some of the goals, uh, if you can? Yeah. So it ties into um, another one of the seven wealth building rules, and that is tracking your progress. Mm -hmm. uh, we're all busy. Uh, and if you're entrepreneurial, you might have your hands in a couple of different projects at one time, um, maybe sure. several real estate projects, or maybe you have a W-2 kind of job and then 
you have a side hustle and then you're doing real estate. You know, a lot of us were involved in different things. Gosh, I, let me tell you, like people yeah. who are on this path, they probably have so much go, going on that be, besides their W2 job, I mean, some of the active uh, printers that I know, oh yes. my God, I mean, they probably have four or five projects going on and it's like, it's a fire. <laughs> Which is wonderful, right? I mean, we right. I appreciate that hustle and that creativity. Absolutely. Um, but the, the fifth, I know we're going out of order, which is fine. Um, but to your point with the goals is to track your progress. Mm -hmm. So one example of that is I would advise your listeners that they should have a net worth statement mm -hmm. in business. You have a balance sheet, a business yeah. has a balance sheet, which lists all of their assets, mm -hmm. all their liabilities. Mm -hmm. And then the worth of the business is found by subtracting the liabilities, the debt from the assets. Sure. I think that uh, we are all well served if we keep track on a personal net worth statement where you add up your assets. I have this much in the bank. I have this much in my 401k. Um, I have um, this property that's worth X number of dollars and you add up all of your assets. Could now I, you could, could do this on a piece of paper. You could use a spreadsheet or there's some fabulous software. We here at LA Wealth Management have a really powerful software platform that we work with clients mm -hmm. to keep track of their net worth statements. And then you, add up all of your debts. You might have credit card debt, hopefully not. You might have student loan debt and you might have mortgages, especially for real estate investors. And so you list your debts. And then to the extent we're talking about money, the game is really to increase your net worth, right? Sure. Mm -hmm. You want to be more worth more a year from now, three years from now, five years from now. And this is the scorecard. And the beautiful part of this, Sakar, is when you break it down to the most fundamental level, there's only two levers you could pull on the net worth statement to increase your wealth. You're either going to increase your assets or decrease your debts or some mm -hmm. combination. Mm -hmm. And keeping track, especially for that person that is in that five projects that we were joking about, mm -hmm. they tend to be hard charging, sure. mm -hmm. powerful people. Um, when they keep score like this, and they can see how their assets are increasing and hopefully at the same time their debts are decreasing, ultimately getting to zero perhaps. Um, that's a pretty powerful motivational tracking mechanism. Absolutely. So that's very simple. And most people most of the time could do it just in a pad and paper at night or you could um, you know, use software and leverage technology. Sure, so sure. that plays into the goals because if the goal is to create cash flow, or if the goal is to reduce debt, or if the goal is to increase the number of properties you have, that's going to show up on your net worth statements. Couldn't, couldn't agree more, Chris. And and what you stated there is like, you know, having that Excel sheet. Uh, I mean, it's, it's very interesting as you're speaking, I'm kind of rolling myself back many years, you know. I like when I started way back like 20 years ago, I didn't know what a personal financial statement was. And it was very interesting uh, experience that I started to put together the, the sheet and it took me several, uh, you know, years and probably 20 some iterations where I was, you know, tracking down, you know, various loans, what the cash flow is. And when it comes to rental properties, for example, there's just so many details as to when you acquired, what the rent is, you know, how much rehab dollars you have put in. Right. Just so much that goes into it. And the great part is that working with individuals like uh, yourself, Chris, is that you kind of get, um, you know, questions that you perhaps haven't yet answered. And there is a measurable way that you can, uh, you know, add those type of elements and outlook into your financial statement. And I kept on doing that. And as a result, you come out with this amazing chart uh, that, oh, yeah. God, I mean, you can like literally start tracking stuff down. And another thing that you said is that how you track your goals or, you know, what your outlook is. I like that fact also is that, you know, personally, I remember, uh, I think it's is again years back when I saw the power of cash flow. I said, what these four properties are doing, if I can do like maybe 10 more and what's my bottom line cash flow number that's going to increase. That's right. That that punch of positiveness and the progress that you can make was so revealing. And personally, I saw that, geez, I can grow a whole lot more financially than my increments on my job. 
to me that was a motivating factor yeah. you know i oh, was yeah. still w2 employed but at the same time geez i said i was multiplying my rental properties like left and right you know but Absolutely. please go, go ahead with but, your but once you i mean you already liked real estate and you thought it would be good to make wealth sure. uh, increase mm. your wealth increase your cash flow but if you don't track it sure and there mm -hmm. are a lot of real estate investors out there that don't track it i've met people before both professionally and just casually where you say, oh, they have X number of properties. And then you say, wow, that's pretty impressive. And then you dig a little deeper. If they're all leveraged to the hilt. Sure. Mm -hmm. And they're not cash flowing. Well, then that's that starts to be a little worrisome then, doesn't sure. it? Absolutely. It's not a problem that can't be solved, but it is something that needs to be addressed. And sticking with the track your progress, I think two other things that are super valuable is for a, to have a, a profit and loss statement. Mm -hmm. um, if you have a business, you should have a P and L profit and loss statement. Sure. Mm -hmm. If you have real estate, you should have a P and L for all of your real estate and you should be able to break it out by individual property. Mm -hmm. I think in lots of instances, Sakar, somebody may have four properties mm -hmm. and on balance, the four properties may be cash flowing, mm -hmm. but you often might have three properties that are performing well and one that's not. And if you just look at them as a group, mm -hmm it might be masking that you have a property that is problematic. Sure. So sure, sure. I think looking at each property or entity individually, mm -hmm. and then looking at it as a team, as a collective group mm -hmm. is really very valuable. And then to your point, it helps with your financial IQ because when you look at the numbers like you're doing and you don't have to be a Harvard finance MBA to do this stuff. Sure. Mm -hmm. But once you kind of know the numbers, you know kind of what works and what doesn't and that increases the chances you get into better deals and don't repeat mistakes that might have been made in the past. So you have to track your progress, both in accumulating mm -hmm. wealth, mm -hmm. but also the profit and loss statement and the last of the big three track your progress documents for me is to have an income statement. Mm -hmm. Most real estate investors are pursuing the strategies of multiple streams of income. Sure. Mm -hmm. And so you want to keep track of where your income is coming from. You might have a job, a side hustle, a couple of properties. Some of the properties may be ones that you're um, investing in actively and then others might be part of some investment syndicate that you're in, sure. but you want to keep track of your income and see where your income is coming from and be able to track what revenue you're bringing into your household from all sources. Sure, sure, sure. Now, um, uh, there, Chris, like a lot of investors uh, who may be perhaps starting out or perhaps in the midstreams, right? Um, could you maybe break down uh, a fundamental differences between, let's say, your portfolio balance sheet versus a profit and loss statement. Uh, if you can, that'd be great for someone to know because a lot of times th people get mixed up as to, oh, geez, what is a PL or, you know, what is a balance sheet of sorts, you know? Right. So the net worth statement is the simpler of the two, I think, to explain. All you're doing is adding up the assets and totaling them and adding up the debts and totaling them sure. and coming up with the sum total of the two. Sure. That's all the net worth statement is. Right. What do you have in assets? What do you have in debts? If you sold all your assets, paid all your debts, what would you be left with? That's your wealth. Right. And again, we're playing the game to drive that higher over time so that we could become wealthier. I do not want to just accumulate properties for the sake of accumulating properties. Oh. I want to accumulate properties ultimately to become wealthy. Right. The profit and loss, when you look at a business or a property, um, it's not looking at how much the property is worth. It's looking at all of the financial activity that occurs in a given period of time, like a year, right. um, that drives the profit for the business. Sure. So in a profit and loss for, say, a single property, you're going to uh, keep track of the rent that comes in. Sure and keep track of the expenses, property tax, insurance, attorney fees, uh, cost to fix up a unit, that kind of thing, to figure sure. out if the property generated a profit on a cash flow basis. Sure, makes complete sense. Makes Did sense. I do that all right? Absolutely, absolutely. Good. Another thing I'd like to talk about uh, is, Sakar, developing a wealth building plan, because as you know, there's lots of different ways to invest in real estate. So when you say a real estate investor, 
that means lots of different things. That could be storage units. It could be flipping homes. It could be buying a fully occupied A class office space. Turnkey uh, completely. Yep. And we've probably both met people that have made money in lots of different ways in real estate. So sure. mm -hmm. you should develop a wealth building plan to figure out what you're going to own, mm -hmm. what you're going to buy. That includes the type of property, where it's going to be, if you're going to do it alone or you're going to have a partner or if you're going to be a part of a syndicate or partnership or real estate investment trust, but really develop a wealth building plan on how you want to build your portfolio of real estate. Sure. And on a more macro level for the household is to, to figure out how you're going to build wealth because that real estate investor might also want to contribute to their 401k. Sure. They may mm -hmm. also want to build up an emergency fund in the bank so that they have some money on hand if they have something negative happened. Sure. Um, so they might not only be investing in real estate to build wealth in a given year or a given mm -hmm. time period. So that would be the macro wealth building plan. You have so much money coming in, you have so much resources to car. How are you going to use that um, income and those resources? How are you going to deploy it? Deploy it. How much goes to real estate? How much goes to the other priorities? Some of those priorities may also be paying down debt. If you want to accumulate wealth, not having a lot of consumer debt is a key contributor to success. Because if you're living above your means and you have lots of credit cards, lots of car debt, lots of student loan debt, that's going to slow you down considerably. So sure. Part of the wealth building plan would be to reduce and or eliminate debt. I think like Robert Kiyosaki in Rich Dad, Poor Dad famously outlined, I think there is a difference between good debt and bad debt. Correct. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, putting a vacation on a credit card is significantly different than maybe taking a cash, uh, cash disbursement from a credit card to buy a property. Sure. We could debate mm -hmm. whether you should be doing that to buy a property, but at least you're acquiring an asset. Right. Fundamentally, it's different. Correct. Yes. Could I mm -hmm. agree, couldn't agree more. Sure. So I think people should develop a wealth building plan to figure out what's right for them. Some people are going to have more emphasis on real estate. Others will have more emphasis on building value in their small business. And still others are going to focus more on paper assets. Mm -hmm. Lots of people are going to have a combination of a couple of things working Mm -hmm. towards building wealth, uh, but having a plan on how you want to do that short, mid and long term, I think works out, works out very well. As an example, Sakar, years ago, this is going back a little bit, I had a, a good friend of mine who was young and he got out of school and he wanted to max out his 401k because he had heard that if you can max out your 401k at a young age, mm -hmm. you'd be fabulously wealthy later on. Sure. <laughs> that's good advice, right? Absolutely. But, but I talked to him and I'm like, Dan, that's good. But I would suggest you don't max out and begin putting some money in other areas, call it buckets of money, sure. because you're in your 20s and you're going to need other things. Sure. And the 401k is great, but you're not supposed to touch it till you get to 59 and a half. And you're going to need other money. Other things are going to happen. Sure. So don't have all your wealth there. Right. And sure enough, after a few years, he did amass a nice little nest egg in that retirement account. But then he met a girl, fell in love, and wanted to buy his first house. What do you think he did? He invaded the 401k. Oh, boy. <laughs> to buy real estate. So he undid a lot of the benefit he was seeking. Sure. Mm -hmm. By not having a good wealth building plan, he was focused too much on one area to the exclusion of others. And a thoughtful process trying to accommodate the different priorities and needs you're going to have, I think works well. Still stuff's going to happen. You can't completely prepare for, you know, sure. mm -hmm. good things, bad things, unfortunate things. Uh, but I think that is a classic example. It's great if you can max out your 401k, but then mm -hmm. when he wanted to buy a house, he had no money. Right. Right. Except right. in his 401k. Sure, sure. I mean, it's a good thing, but I guess perhaps, you know, he's got, he, at a young age, as you pointed out, he, he had it tilted much towards, uh, you know, so there could be other intermediate things he should have probably planned for, you know. Yes. And another um, thing I would say is, and this is something I, I would love to get your thoughts on too, is uh, 
for real estate investors is to be prepared. Uh, there's a lot of really great material out there. There's podcasts like yours, sure. podcasts mm -hmm. like mine. I know that's self-promotional, uh, but there's some great books, articles, websites. Sure. But sometimes I think people just kind of rush in a little too haphazardly. Mm -hmm. It's a tough business. There are a lot of sharks and tough, experienced business people. And if you're not careful, you'll get beaten up pretty good. Sure. I know sure. I've gotten beaten up before in, in real estate and sure. been sure. on the bad end of some deals that I've hopefully learned from. So I would urge people to be prepared. Do your homework. Sure. Uh, some people, they'll leave a, a seminar or rah-rah about real estate and they'll, they'll buy the first rehab property they find. <laughs> That's dangerous stuff. Absolutely. Be prepared. You have to do your homework, get educated, talk to people, read, um, practice. Um, and when you buy your first property, when you get into your first deal, however it's structured, you really don't want to blow yourself up that first deal. So right. you want to put the time in just like if you're not a runner, you wouldn't go out and all of a sudden run a marathon. You'd have to train and prepare to get ready for the endeavor. I think with real estate and wealth building in general, you do want to be prepared. And part of that preparation is to build a team. Um, I'm part of my client's team. I'm not the only member, but I want sure. to be a resource to help my clients increase their financial IQ, make smart decisions with money. But other members of the team are CPAs, attorneys, real estate agents, appraisers, tradesmen, uh, people that put together real estate syndicates. I, you know, everybody's team is going to look different. Sure. But I think you would agree this isn't an individual sport. So being prepared is also to gather up resources. I know for myself, uh, I've done well with real estate. But I have some limitations. I am not a handy guy and I don't sure. know much about that stuff. So I really need to surround myself with folks that could help with that kind of thing because you don't want me as a partner or in a real estate deal where you want me to go in and fix something physically. <laughs> no, I know. And I, I like to always say this, that it's not the resources, it's really your resourcefulness uh, that sure. perhaps, uh, you know, comes into, um, you know, more importance as you start to develop your real estate, uh, uh, you know, journey. Uh, it's pretty much, you know, like how much you know, also, you know, how many other folks, you know, whether it's the plumbers, the electricians or the contractors and things like that, because they are the ones who, who are going to help you execute your business plan and vision. That's right. Know? And right. the, the more folks you can trust, whether it's your like folks who are uh, closing the deals or, you know, wholesalers or your title of folks, your attorneys and things like that. I mean, it's, it's as you described, it's, it's part of your sort of your global team. And the more people you have uh, to cover yourself on different angles of it, Absolutely. Uh, it's, I mean, it makes your life so easy. I mean, uh, we are fortunately in an, in an informational age where you can click a button or, uh, you know, uh, click on a URL and you have the information right there, you know? So it's, it's really that, uh, I mean, to me, it's a passion of resourcefulness uh, pretty much every day that how can I get better? You know, how can I learn more? You know, and that's one of the reasons also that, uh, you know, I started this podcast and, you know, I'm thankful to guests like you, you know, like who bring in a lot more knowledge and, you know, viewers can definitely learn out of all of this. So, but go ahead, uh, Chris, with your thought. Hmm. No, I think we covered a lot of my seven wealth building. We talked about goals. We talked about being prepared. Uh, we talked about building a team, developing a wealth building plan. It's important to track your progress. Um, two things we didn't touch on, and if time allows, we could cover a bit, is be diversified. Um, that, that, that's another thing I was just going to ask you uh, uh, there, Chris, is that at what point or what is your suggestion about, you know, different asset classes, whether it's the stocks, bonds, or, uh, you know, other things that, uh, how do you advise uh, folks to have a balance of that? That's one thing. And based on someone's age, for example, how those things differ? Yes. Uh, age, I think, now that I'm almost 50, um, the age is more meaningful to me as I've become more experienced. Sure. Is that at this stage of the game, because I've um, become 
affluence, more affluence, right? Wealthier. Sure. Um, I really don't want to get involved in anything that I used the term earlier that blow myself up, right? Sure. I want to stay mm -hmm. diversified. I want to sure. increase my wealth, but I don't want to put too much risk in any one area that mm -hmm. I have a significant setback. Sure. Now, mm -hmm. if you have a listener that they're in the twenties and they're an upstart, they, they might put more risk in a particular pro project mm -hmm. um, because they're young and aggressive and they don't have as much on the line. Mm -hmm. But at this point, I'm not going to take a big percentage of my wealth and put it at risk in any single area. So age does factor in. I think generally though, Sakar, what I want people to focus on is not so much the percentage of the allocation, but to really just think it through what's right for you. Um, I've met people that they have all of their wealth or the vast majority of their wealth is in their family owned business. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But you and I both know lots of family owned businesses that for one reason or another encounter significant trouble, maybe even sure. fail. No, absolutely. And I think, I mean, it's kind of, uh, I mean, not, not to sort of, uh, you know, uh, throw nails on a coffin here, but I mean, a lot of family businesses through this pandemic uh, are absolutely yes. having a pretty hard time. And the, like a lot of families, that's all they had. Yes. Uh, and it's, it's, just a, it's as crazy as it sounds that you can't even go out or the businesses can't open doors. I mean, a lifetime, uh, you know, hard work and wealth have, have that's right. been wiped out. It's, it's mm. absolutely unfortunate. So, so a small business owner should not always plow back all of the proceeds back into that business. They should diversify. Sure. And I don't think real estate investors should consistently put all of their eggs in one property um, you want to diversify. Now, again, that means different things to different people. Sure. Um, and there's no right formula. Mm -hmm. I've met people that have more wealth in real estate and they've become wealthy. I've met people that have more wealth in their business and others that don't have either. And most of it is in their 401ks and IRAs and stocks, bonds, and mutual funds. Sure. There's lots of ways to accumulate wealth, but thinking through diversification and spreading the risk out and pulling in different types of investments, whether it's real estate, small business, stocks, or even alternative stuff, some of the things you mentioned earlier, th th those are all well and good. For your listeners, I think the primary message is to be diversified. Try not to be in a position where you're going to blow yourself up if something goes wrong. Uh, and sometimes you can make a mistake as a business owner, or like with the pandemic, it could be out of your control. It could be competition or some type of technological disruption. I've also met flippers that only have their money in their flip properties. Sure. And if you're starting out, I could appreciate where you might have to do that at the beginning. But as you grow and evolve and become wealthier and more experienced, you may want to spread that risk out because there are times when that market is troublesome sure. and you sure. want to have staying power you don't only want to be successful while the markets are good because all markets will have periods where they will have problems and you don't want to get flushed out during those um, periods. So by diversifying, by spreading out the risk, you mitigate the risk. All of these things have a certain amount of risk. Uh, you're not getting away from the risk, but you're spreading the risk out. You're mitigating, mitigating your overall risk. I use the example of the client that had real estate, the small business, and a portfolio of paper assets. And there's been times when that business has been thriving, like it is now, actually. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, but in the first quarter, we know that in 2020, the stock market didn't do particularly well in the first quarter. Sure, sure. Um, but her mm -hmm. real estate was fine. So two-thirds of her plan were fine and one was struggling. Uh, but in the second quarter, the stock market recovered. Sure. But then we had this odd thing with you can't evict people and she had some tenants that were not paying. Mm -hmm. It's mm -hmm. not fatal to her. It's not a big problem. Sure. But all of a sudden now her rent roll is a little problematic. Right. Mm -hmm. But she's diversified. She'll be able to ride it out because it won't last. That problem will get solved one way or the other. Sure. Sure. Mm -hmm. So be diversified. And uh, the last thing is to be careful with debt. Um, real estate investors often use debt. And I don't think that's automatically bad. Right. Uh, but I also found over the course of 
my career and having interacted with lots of real estate investors and having gone to lots of seminars, I think too many people are a little too cavalier about the dangers of debt. Sure. And I would urge people to think carefully about the use of debt. Uh, and it ties into the be diversified. If you have too much debt and you don't have enough resources behind it and it's not well thought out, you run the risk that you'll get swamped if something bad happens. And you don't want to put yourself in that position. If you own a property with no debt, granted, you don't get the leverage, that magnification that debt provides for you. Sure. But also the corresponding benefit of not having debt is that, you know, if you have a rent interruption or you have a little bit of problem, it's a little easier to deal with because you don't have monthly obligations. Sure. It's, it's a balance, as you point out, right? I mean, a lot of times I like to say that it's great to, you know, uh, compress your debt and have tenants perhaps pay down and whatnot. And, and, and not to sit on like just free equity, maybe have a line of credit or sorts, right? Yes. I mean, you can like multiply and grow faster through that. So, it's kind of a trade-off. I like to say sometimes that, you know, debt is great, but not having too much is extremely uh, important, Correct. you know? Correct. So, and don't, and don't be so reckless with debt. Sure. Realize that it's a tool, but it's a dangerous tool in the same way that fire is wonderful. It could help feed you and keep you warm. It could also burn your house down. Absolutely. And I think just a little bit of caution and just be wide eyed and thinking about real estate and don't be too cavalier about it. And you know, what I've done over the course of my career is I used to have debt on the properties. And mm -hmm. as I've gotten older and wealthier, I, we made the decision that was right for my wife and I is that we were focused on, we're gonna, we have the properties we wanted to keep and we focused on paying off the debt. And that's not sure. to say that I might not one day do a real estate project where I would take on debt, sure. but we went on one of those goal setting binges, if you will, where mm -hmm. we wanted to have our properties all debt free. Sure. And so I've had debt and I've had no debt on the properties. Both will work. And some of it depends on where you are in the life cycle, right? Because sure. if you have sure. debt on property and you won the Powerball and you won $50 million, <laughs> you probably pay off the debt. Absolutely. Absolutely. No, so, it's, it's, um, been, it's been great, Chris. I, I definitely, you know, like all the advice being diversified at debt of worse, uh, setting the goals properly, have, you know, midterm, you know, long-term, short-term goals. It's, it's definitely great advice. Uh, now, a couple of last questions, uh, Chris, like through your investing journey and the number of uh, folks you have met and things like that, uh, what are some of the good advice that you have received from others, perhaps that keeps you uh, sort of disciplined and uh, on your like best course, uh, uh, you know, every day? Yeah, I think um, that's a great question. I think, and it's it's particularly important this year with the pandemic, where as a small business owner, um, it's been a difficult period and a scary time. I think the advice from people I've met that are older than me that have been through the battles sure. is the idea that you're going to have setbacks. You're going to have mistakes and it's okay. Yeah. Um, you play the game hard. You play competitively. Investing in real estate is hard. It's competitive. The results can be fabulous and it's very worthwhile. Um, but the advice that to stick with it to learn from the mistakes and not get discouraged when things don't go your way, either you make a mistake or things didn't work out as intended, that it's a marathon, not a sprint, sure. I think is very, very important. Uh, we joked before we went on air about, you know, I, I have lots of experience, which is great, but you know, some of that experience has left scars. <laughs> sure, sure, sure. I mean, you, you learn the lessons and as you point out, uh, Chris, as well, that it's a long game. I mean, uh, you know, in this information age, we like to think that, hey, someone posted on Facebook or someone uh, posted this, hey, I mean, I wanna do that instant gratification type of culture that we That's have, right? right? But real estate, uh, as you rightfully said, is, is definitely a long-term horizon game. I mean, you got, debt i mean you're slowly paying it down and things like that so you have to kind of uh you know adjust your perspectives based on that and you know be uh, mindful of some of those things and not to you know kind of 
uh, go on a sort of a, a debt cycle, as you uh, said there, Chris, is that we be very mindful of those things. So uh, thank you for your time, uh, Chris. It's been great. Uh, I think some of the advice that you have given, I hope the uh, listeners found a lot of good takeaways from all of that. Uh, I mean, you know, your experience being a certified financial planner. Uh, so you are speaking from a vantage of a lot of experience, help uh, so many clients so far. So uh, thank you for your time today. Uh, please share with the listeners, uh, Chris, how they can, uh, you know, find you and learn more about your company. Yeah, go to uh, the website. It's uh, ElliotWealth.com. Elliot has two L's and two T's. Um, two areas I'll draw your attention to is the financial planning software that we talked about earlier, Sakar, uh, help people track their progress. That's under the Elliott Wealth Success Planner. Um, there's a free demo that your listeners could try out. And then mm -hmm. if they want, um, we could talk about working with them. Additionally, they could contact us at the page. If they put in the Premium Cash Flow Podcast, the name of your show, uh, we could do a complimentary consultation, an initial consultation. If they wanted to talk about some of these self, seven wealth building rules, if there's any way I could be a resource for your listeners, uh, that would be great. And maybe that'll lead to them being a client, maybe not. But I'd, I'd love to hear from some of your listeners. So go to ElliotWealth.com. Awesome. Thank you, Chris. It's been great advice and a lot of experience you bring into the table. So I appreciate your time today. Thank you. For it was a lot of fun. It was a great discussion. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for listening to Premium Cash Flow Real Estate Investing Podcast. Please join us at premiumcashflow.com to sign up for weekly updates, research articles, and more. We will see you again for another great interview with an expert guest.